Welcome, everybody. Nice to be here physically. <laughs> I think it's new for everybody now. We've become so used to being inside our own homes <laughs> while giving lectures and stuff. Well, welcome at the NEO Symposium Contested Objects. Uh, NEOS is short for the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study. It's an international research institute where each year about 50 scholars, artists, and writers work on curiosity-driven and interdisciplinary research projects within the humanities. We're kicking off today um, with a symposium at the Trippenhuis. Welcome, again. Uh, this is the headquarters of the KNAW, the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences. And thank you, everybody who is watching online. Um, my name is Rita Wedrago. I work as a curator at Framer Fame, but also as an independent curator. Hey. <laughs> and uh, I see some familiar faces. And I also work as a writer and researcher. Contested objects, the racial and colonial dimensions of material culture. How, when, and why do objects become contested? Today, we invite you to think along with us as we collectively explore the racial and colonial dimensions of material culture. More and more attention is given to those who have been critical about these objects. There seems to be a collective reckoning of the power these objects wield. What happens if we look beyond museums and archives and also take into account other things like architecture, monuments, food, interior design, and the intimate objects we live with on a daily basis. During this NEO symposium, we will collectively explore what insights we can gain by shedding light on the racial and colonial dimensions of our material culture. When do objects start to live their own life? And do they ever? And how are we active agents in this? Even though the context of an object defines most of its meaning, the context itself can change too. And so we wonder, when and why do objects become contested? And how complex is this process? What objects can connect to, but also lead to contestation? Can the materiality of an object pose constraints to what we can read in an object? I hope that today we can together explore the power of things. Then the program for today, we will start um, shortly with an introduction text by Jan Willem Duivendak, director of NIAS and professor of sociology of the University of Amsterdam. And his speech will be followed by two keynote speakers, Britta Schilling and Raoul Rao. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A and we really invite you all to ask questions and think with us and uh, feel free to pose any questions. Um, after the, after the, the keynote speakers and the Q&A, there will be the parallel workshops. On oh, no, the first there's actually lunch, but then there will be the parallel workshops. And I will explain a bit more about this later because actually it's, it's all organized very well, but there will be four different workshops and everybody will be um, escorted to their workshop space uh, afterwards. But I will explain about this a bit later. And we will close the symposium at Foxpop and hope to see you all there for spoken word and drinks. Um, anything else? Yes, I already said, please feel free to ask questions uh, during the workshops as well, but during the Q&A and, &A and uh, yeah, feel free to feel free. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> an introduction by Jan Willem Duivendak, NIOS Director of Pro and Professor of Sociology. Welcome also on my behalf to this NIOS Symposium 2022. Uh, as the moderator already briefly mentioned, uh, NIOS is an international interdisciplinary research institute 
And indeed, every year, NIAS invites, welcomes a diverse group of about 50 fellows, scholars, artists, journalists, and writers. Fellows at NIAS carry out research that is totally curiosity-driven in an hopefully open-minded minded ambience. And this symposium aims to recreate a NIAS-like atmosphere, one that stimulates dialogue and collective learning. In doing so, we hope, in all modesty, to offer new perspectives on ongoing public and academic debates regarding the racial and colonial dimensions of material culture, while at the same time acknowledging that a lot of research is already being car carried out in this field by many scholars, some present here today and some presenting here today. Moreover, we welcome the reflection that's taking place regarding contested objects within the KNW, the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences, particularly in the Omstreden Monumenten, Contested Monuments Advisory Group. And hopefully today's presentations and discussions will contribute to their work. So this year we explore contested objects, a focus both on the act or fact of contestation as well as on the object that is contested, which provokes contestation. What does the contestation of objects tell us about the interconnectedness of the subjective and the objective, the meaningfulness of material culture? This focus on processes of contestation in relation to racism and colonialism fits into a series of annual events that NIAS has organized in the past four years. Previous editions of the annual NIAS lecture series dealt with, in 2018, Violence and the History of Inequality by Walter Scheidel, de Waalse Kerk, 2019, Decolonization and the Political Use of History with Ian Burema at the Oude Lutherse Kerk. And in last year, 2021, An Imagined Past, The Politics of History Making with, among others, Mayor Femke Halsema at Pakhuis de Zwijger. All online. This year we decided that one lecture would not do, not only given the complexity of the theme, but also because we wanted to hear the voices of many of our fellows. As a result, our annual NIAS lecture has become the NIAS Symposium. We have shifted our model, rather than flying in a scholar for a standalone lecture, our aim this year is to contribute to various aspects of this topic by giving the floor to many of our fellows and colleagues working in this field. By focusing on contested objects, we follow what has been called the material turn in academia. And let me try to summarize this turn with the help of Bernike Pasveer. The most important aspect of this turn is that the material is not perceived as the tacit background against which the human can pro pro proliferate but as an integral and active part of whatever society comes to be. It's about the devices, the objects and material settings in and through which humanity is being performed, and the operation, the techniques and practices through which things, objects, environments and infrastructures become invested with specific qualities and capacities. To better understand this, it might help to look at its contrast. The idea of the social as totally discursively shaped and socially disciplined. The social, the human, the collective, the political, the religious, as only consisting of discourses, ideas, will, votes, deliberation, linguistic or procedural terms. The material turn moves beyond Foucault in that objects are not only constitutive of human agency, but it is through and with material objects that the social proceeds. The social as inherently material, and the material as not only enabling or constraining, but actively participating to whatever the social comes to be. Think of religion. Doing religion, being religious, 
does not only consist of mind and belief, but it requires churches and mosques and synagogues. It requires candles, foodways, religious books, specific rituals like eggs for Easter and sweet food during a heet al fiter. And these things are not only symbols or projections of human will or imagination, they channel and embody what being religious is and requires. They enact reli religiousness. Or think of colonialism, of course, and the statues and architecture materializing and commemorating those days, which we will hear more about in a minute. The material turn has offered many new insights, but I have to admit that I'm still struggling with how exactly the entanglement of the material and the meaningful works. I'm perhaps stuck halfway in the turn at 180 degrees. Is it eventually not the human subject that is attaching meaning, who categorizes objects as contested or uncontested? Or is that still a too idealistic position for those who fully embrace the material term? In other words, I'm looking forward to the keynotes and the workshops, both because of the substantial discussions, but also to learn more about the material term. We will look at various objects, temporary ones, such as food and meals, but also, but also built heritage. We will zoom in and out from the pri private to the public and take into account different eras from today's new media to the classics. And we will not only focus on the Netherlands or other Western context, but also visit Ghana, Syria, Indonesia and more places along the way. Speaking of locations, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners who have helped turn the symposium into a vibrant multi-venue event. The Allard Pearson Museum, Vox Pop, the University of Amsterdam and the Royal Academy, where we are now. I would also like to thank all of those speaking today and those who have contributed to the event organization especially our moderator, Rita Wojdraogo, colleagues from NLAP, the students of Amsterdam United, and the makers of the Far Too Close podcast. And thanks, of course, to you, the symposium participants. I hope you will actively take part in our conversations and workshops. After two years of mainly online sessions, with fewer options for interaction, we really want to create a vibrant atmosphere at today's symposium, learning collectively. Let's get started. Thank you, Jan Willem. We continue with our first keynote speaker, Britta Schilling. Britta Schilling is an associate professor of cultural history at Utrecht University and a fellow at NIOS. Her research centers on the history of empire and colonial memory and draws on a wide range of archival sources. She is the author of Postcolonial Germany, in which she traces the evolution of collective memory of German colonialism. In her current research, Schilling explores objects beyond the traditional archive as she explores the private sphere of the colonial home with a specific focus on sub-Saharan Africa and German colonial colonialists. Taking this as a start, during today's presentation, Schilling will shed light on intentional versus unintentional monuments. Thank you, Rita, for that introduction. Um, thank you also for um, inviting me and to, to contribute to this symposium and for organizing such a fantastic event. So uh, when we speak about contested objects, we often think about statues and monuments because they've been in the news lately a lot. And they have actually been contested objects for decades before now as well. But what I want to do today is um, to push this idea of contested objects a little bit further and to think about, 
two sets of objects that are perhaps contestable, but that haven't actually received quite as much attention as monuments and statues uh, and memorials to the colonial past. And I want to wonder why that is. So uh, the first set of objects that I want to look at is colonial architecture. And I'm thinking colonial architecture in the widest sense of any sort of architecture or building that bears the visible traces of the colonial past. And we have plenty of examples around Amsterdam, of course, and one of the workshops is going to guide you through some of those. Um, but the ones I want to talk about today are located in Namibia. And Namibia um, was a German uh, settlement colony between 1884 and uh, 1915, when it was taken over by the South African government as a mandate territory. And it was ruled by South Africa, also under apartheid rule until 1990. And you might be aware already that the German government recently has recognized the murder of thousands and thousands of Herero and Nama in Namibia, um, what was then German Southwest Africa, under German colonial rule as genocide and there are ongoing talks uh, about financial uh, uh, settlements. Now, as Namibians have increasingly protested monuments to the German colonial past in centers like Windhoek or Swakopmund, there has, as far as I'm aware, been comparatively less um, sort of open protest um, and calls to raise to the ground German colonial architecture. And I'm wondering, why is that? Now, on the one hand, um, there is a prominent, vocal, uh, powerful German-speaking community still in Namibia today. Some of these objects also, um, this architecture, has been placed on the register for national heritage, still under South African rule. So as long as they're still on this register and listed buildings, they are in some ways untouchable. They can't be torn to the ground unless there's a major rethink of what constitutes Namibian heritage. But um, what I find interesting and, and more important almost is that the look of these buildings, um, they, they actually, the look of towns uh, sometimes are defined, Swakopmund, Windhoek, if you go there, uh, are defined by these, this architecture. And uh, that draws in tourists. And tourism is the second largest contributor to the GDP of Namibia after mining. And it's a sector that the Namibian government would like to increase in future as well. Now, an important player in this discussion is a company called Namdeb. And Namdeb is a joint venture between the Namibian government and the De Beers mining company. And Namdeb, um, owns certainly not all of these buildings, but some of these buildings. They um, own the one on the left in Luderitz, which was used as a guest house, but is also open to tourists. And the ones uh, on the right-hand side that are in Kolmanskop, or uh, the German name was Kolmanskoppe, which, uh, which was an old mining town. It was where the first diamonds were discovered in 1908 by Zacharias Loala. And, um, it was abandoned already when the, the diamonds dried out in the 1920s, completely desolate by the 1950s. It's now a ghost town, but it's really popular amongst tourists. And um, tourists uh, come in, and, and amateur uh, and professional photographers come in. They pay for a pass to enter this usually restricted area. Uh, and they, uh, the, it's very, this architecture is very popular because it's evocative in some way. Um, these images are evocative images. And the question is evocative of what? Of colonial ruin or of colonial nostalgia? Perhaps it depends on who's paying. Now, if we look, um, if we think of these buildings as um, material culture, these material lives of these objects are coming to an important crossroads um, where you have to think about whether they need to be kept up or whether they actually um, should be allowed to decay. And we see um, this, this thinking going on um, by the uh, uh, Namdeb and by the proprietors who are running this ghost town. Um, but if we think about those buildings, they're not actually being torn down. 
they're actually being either restored partially or being allowed to consciously decay. And that's really what uh, evokes this um, uh, sort of uh, evocative value of these objects. Now, for the second set of objects, um, sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> my, my um, pointer person is, is um, uh, I'm not being very nice to her at the moment. Um, for the second set of objects, um, we have to go behind closed doors. And we have to think um, a little bit about um, domestic spaces across Europe. And in a lot of these domestic spaces, we find here an, another set of objects that belong to the colonial past or evoke the colonial past. And they could be as small as an ebony elephant on the mantelpiece. They could be as ornate as this Zanzibar chest that was purchased on a market in East Africa by an ex-colonial civil servant and is now in a bedroom in Kent. They could be as utilitarian as an elephant's foot waste paper basket, or they could be as openly mired in the violent histories of the colonial past as a silk robe that was looted from the imperial palace um, from the Chinese emperor during the Boxer Rebellion. And these are all actually examples that I've found in families, you might call colonial families, that have an ancestor um, that was uh, somehow involved in the colonial project in Germany and Britain. Now, what do these objects mean to the people who are holding on to them? Well, for some, they are traces of a colonial past that is deeply personal, that is bound up with their own life story. And it's a memory of their career overseas. And for others who have inherited these objects, maybe across several generations, sometimes they've become sort of decontextualized um, uh, images of empire, decontextualized exotic ornaments of empire, you might say. They may trigger a reckoning with the colonial or imperial past, but they don't always do so because they are so bound up with family history, with family identity, with personal identity that comes from that as well. So these private lives of objects also need to be worked through, but maybe that work occurs a little bit differently than the encounter with colonial objects in public space. So what do all these examples, the Zanzibar chest in Kent, the colonial homes in Namibia, the silk robe um, that's in Germany now, what do they all have in common? And thinking about uh, then this debate about monuments we've been following for the past few years, I think it might be really useful as thinking of them as unintentional monuments to the colonial past. And that idea of unintentional monuments is something that was posed by the art historian, uh, the Austrian art historian Alois Riegel. And Riegel was actually writing in 1903. Uh, around a time when a lot of these monuments perhaps were even being created. And I think some of his ideas, certainly not all of his ideas, but some of them might be useful in taking up and framing the debate that we're having now. So let me explain further. So Riegel says that there are two kinds of monuments. There are intentional monuments, and for these monuments, their power and their mnemonic or memory value is generated by the people who created them, by their makers. Um, and often, literally, that's inscribed on the monuments themselves. And this might include, for example, statues of Cecil Rhodes, statues of Ye Pi Kun, um, statues of Gandhi. Um, so, so these are the intentional monuments. And then we have another class of unintentional monuments. And unintentional monuments are, have a value that is actually determined by modern society, by us. We say whether or not this is a valuable object or monument. And they could be valuable to us because they are of particular historical value. And in that case, we might find those objects more valuable that are more like they were in their original state. But these objects also are prone to decay. They are prone to elements, um, to wind, to rain, if they're standing outside, to the forces of nature, also to the forces of human nature 
And uh, Regal importantly realizes this as part of the history and the social lives of these objects, of these unintentional monuments. But that brings me to the second set of unintentional monuments. And these are ones um, where we actually see the ravages of nature on the material. We can read that off of the material, the time, the, the sand coming through the holes in the window, the peeling wallpaper. And all of this, really, these signs classify these objects as no longer being of our time. And Riegel says that these objects have a value that is an age value. The material here actually isn't that important. It's a necessary evil, he says. Um, it's a way of getting at an emotional response, an emotional connection to the cycle of birth and decay that is part of human nature, and that is part of humanity, part of nature in itself, that is so fundamentally says it's universal. And here he says it's almost religious. So if I'm questioning why these objects, these unintentional monuments, haven't been torn down in the case of architecture, if they haven't been given back to their original owners in the case of some objects in private possession, if they haven't been simply thrown away in the case of others, then I'm also in a way asking, why are they still valued today and by whom? And that value might just as well be an emotional, evocative value as a strictly historical value. They may actually be valuable to people because of their fragmentation, because of their incompleteness, because of their pastness. So there's no government policy on how to deal with unintentional monuments, and how could there be, really? They're so varied. Um, they're owned by, could be owned by museums and universities. They could be owned just as well by private companies or by private individuals in families. But every time a statue or an, another intentional monument to the colonial past gets defaced or torn down, and we read about it in the headlines, perhaps we should also be reminded of the millions of unintentional monuments that are still scattered across the globe <coughs> and are just as important and just as much a part of coming to terms with a colonial and imperial past. Thank you. Thank you, Britta. I wanted to pose one question, and then afterwards we'll have more questions. Um, but isn't what's keeping these unintentional mon monuments in place merely colonial nostalgia? Well, colonial nostalgia is a, is a really important uh, topic and, and really important theme that, that comes up when we talk about these objects. And I think um, some of the reasons why these objects haven't uh, been, been taken down, have, are still in place, has to do with the fact that they are in, in some ways invisible. Um, in they're so much, as I mentioned, part of everyday life that people in civic space um, might walk past them and not really realize that they're there. So in that sense, um, uh, initiatives like walking tours, like websites, podcasts, are really important for making them visible. But in terms of the, the idea of um, what is actually keeping them once we know that they're there, um, colonial nostalgia, um, well, it's, it's really interesting to think about um, the, the way that, um, what that means. Usually, um, people, when they think of nostalgia, they think of sort of an innocent yearning for a something that's past, mm -hmm. but also a return to that past, a recreation of that past. And um, uh, scholar Svetlana Boim has really made that clear in taking that apart. There's the nostos, kind of the restorative aspect of nostalgia, and alja, the, um, uh, the, the reductive aspect, the yearning, uh, the, the, the uh, loss as well. So there's the, the nostos, the home, or the yearning for home, and the, the alja, the loss of home. And I think that uh, a lot of the um, owners or the keepers or the managers of some of these objects today, they um, feel the alja, but they um, don't necessarily want to recreate colonialism. 
Um, I don't think that goes for a lot of, even the ex-colonial civil servants don't want to go back to colonialism, certainly not the Namibian government. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, there is this sense of the, that these objects actually are firmly in the past. They're fragments of a past. Um, and so um, that's what's, what's sort of um, perhaps complicated, though, is, is clinging on to that past, perhaps blinding us to continuations in the present. Mm. Um, but, but anyway, my point about colonial nostalgia is that, that it's, it's far more complicated, perhaps, than we might immediately think yeah. um, and, and deserves some differentiation. And there are various scholars that are working on that and, and refining that definition for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to it. And um, uh, yeah, now I'm going to introduce Raoul. Thank you, Britta. We continue with our second keynote uh, by Raoul Rao. Raoul Rao is a fellow at the NIOS and lecturer in international political thought at the University of St. Andrews in the UK. Prior to, to this, he taught at SOAS University of London and University College at Oxford. He's the author of Out of Time, The Queer Politics of Postcoloniality and Third World Protest Between Home and the World. He's a member of the Radical Philosophy Collective and blogs occasionally at the Disorder of Things. At NIOS, Rao is working on a new project, The Psychic Lives of Statues. Rao questions why statues have become terrains for assertion and contestation of racial and caste supremacy. Today, Rao will share some of his thoughts with us, taking the statue of Gandhi as a starting point. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, and uh, thanks to all the staff who've been working really hard behind the scenes to make this event uh, possible. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to drag us back to the obvious, to the things that are in plain sight um, around us. And to begin with, um, on the 18th of June in 2020, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests that were taking place in different parts of the world, uh, a statue of Gandhi in Amsterdam was, uh, let me not use the word vandalized or desecrated or defaced, but uh, let's say reinscribed uh, <laughs> by persons I'm, I'm not aware of. In fact, there might be people in the audience here who know more about what happened that day than I do, in which case this is the time perhaps to talk about it. Um, so the statue was covered with red paint. And as you can see, the word racist was uh, scribbled on the, on the base. Um, and the numbers 1312, I believe, stand for ACAB. All cops are bastards. Um, there's something poetic about the location of this statue on a street called Churchill Lamb, because in this exact same moment, a statue of Churchill in London was inscribed, reinscribed, with that exact same word. This was not an isolated incident, because in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests, most of which were against statues of white supremacist figures, um, statues of Gandhi also became targets of uh, uh, protest and attack in Canada, in the US, and uh, more recently in Australia, and I'm sure elsewhere. Nor was this the first moment in which Gandhi statues had been targeted. Um, not long after the eruption of the Roads Must Fall movement in South Africa, five years earlier, uh, Gandhi statues in South Africa also became targets of protest. And soon after that, uh, in Ghana, which I'll talk about shortly, in Malawi, uh, and also in the UK, in Manchester. So what is going on in these protests? The arguments against Gandhi are fairly consistent across these different protest moments. But I'll focus on the protests in Ghana, uh, partly because I was able to interview some of the protesters, but also because uh, there was a very well-publicized petition put on change.org, I believe. So the protesters in Ghana made three arguments that are central, I think, to the case against Gandhi. Uh, the first is that Gandhi was a racist. Uh, as an activist in South Africa, he had campaigned not against racial hierarchy per se, but to renegotiate the position of the Indian community in the prevailing racial hierarchy, 
without necessarily attacking the premise of racial ordering. Much of his activism took the form of seeking Indian advancement by emphasizing the closeness of Indians to whites and their distance from black South Africans. And he was also given to referring to black South Africans with the racial slurs that were in common use at the time. The second argument is that Gandhi was casteist. Um, he offered idealized and disingenuous defenses of the caste system in Hinduism, that it accommodated diversity and unity, for example, that everyone was equal in the eyes of God, even if not in the eyes of fellow human beings. And even when he came to acknowledge the evils of the caste system, which he did, his uh, reform efforts or his, his arguments were always that reform had to come from within the Hindu community rather than from the state. His fiercest Indian critic, B.R. Ambedkar, was the leader of the Dalit community and the architect of the Indian constitution. Uh, Dalit is the term uh, you may know that is used to refer to people who are formerly called untouchables, who are outside of the caste system. Uh, it means broken people. Uh, but it is now a term that has been appropriated by the community. It's a term of pride and empowerment. The third argument was less about Gandhi and more about India, and was an argument about Indian imperialism. And this argument is made in slightly different ways in different places. But uh, for the Ghanaian protesters, they, they sought to draw attention to the ways in which India increasingly impinges on the African continent, hungry for land and resources. And it increasingly registers in the minds of a contemporary African public through reports in the press of racist hate crimes against Africans in Indian cities who've gone there to work or to study. In the very month that the Gandhi statue was unveiled in Ghana, a Congolese man was murdered in New Delhi. And this is not an isolated incident. We read of situations like this, um, unfortunately, quite frequently. At least one of the Ghanaian protesters argued that rather than building statues, uh, the government of India might be better placed to take action against the racism that African migrants experience in India and that this might offer a more effective way of deepening relations between the two places, which is what the installation of the statue was meant to have achieved. So why is all this happening now? I think one very important reason is that the Dalit critique of Gandhi, of the caste system, of Hinduism itself, is becoming much better known globally. This is not the first moment that Dalit arguments have been visible globally. Uh, you may know of the Dalit Panther Party, which in the 1970s was very much inspired by the Black Panther Party. But perhaps it's much better known within India than outside. More recently, in 2001, at the UN World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance, also known as the Durban Conference Against Racism, uh, Dalit activists campaigned for international recognition in international law of caste as a category of discrimination that was analogous to race. They were technically unsuccessful because of the countervailing voices of the Indian government. But I think this was an important moment because they obtained wider global political recognition of what caste means, of how it's experienced, and how international law should take cognizance of it as a form of discrimination. Domestically, in many Western jurisdictions, particularly in the US and UK, there is increasingly prominent uh, campaigning for caste to be recognized in Western legal systems as a category of discrimination. There has also been strong pushback from dominant caste Hindu groups and organizations in these countries. So these efforts have not always been successful, but the mere articulation of these arguments has, I think, given caste and Dalit critique much more prominence on a global stage. But alongside these developments in the law have also been a series of uh, voices, developments in popular culture. Uh, highly articulate Dalit scholars and activists, uh, including in the diaspora, now address a global audience, particularly on social media, and have successfully, I think, made their case, particularly in analogy and in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Uh, People like Suraj Yangre, Sujata Gidla, Yashika Dutt, Meena Kandasamy. Uh, if these are not names you're familiar with, uh, they should be. And I think increasingly they will be 
more and more uh, prominent names. So alongside these developments in Dalit politics and critique, there have been some other developments in black radical thought recently that perhaps also have put figures like Gandhi in the spotlight. One strain of contemporary radical, mostly US-based black political thought is what is known as Afro-pessimism, which might be a familiar uh, term to some of you. Afro-pessimism is pessimistic about the utility of umbrella terms like people of color, precisely because of the role they argue that non-black people of color have played as junior partners. These are the terms that Frank Wilderson uses, junior partners to whiteness and imperialism. And we might say that Gandhi is one exhibit of that tendency. Not all radical black thinkers accept these arguments. So there is a very powerful counter critique from an older black Marxist tradition, which I think is, has for a long time been recrafting Marxism to take race and racial capitalism seriously, as Cedric Robinson uh, theorized it. And this tradition in black radical thought insists on the possibility of transnational solidarity, uh, despite these problems. What I think we're witnessing is a moment in which perhaps it's becoming clear that Afro-pessimism might be wrong to be pessimistic about the possibility of solidarity per se, but it might be right in thinking that the old solidarities have not worked and that something has to shift, something has to change in the way we think about solidarity. And so what I think we're witnessing now is a newer and perhaps a more nuanced form of transnational solidarity between black and Dalit uh, movements, rather than black and an undifferentiated people of color, um, whatever that term means. And in, and in fact, alongside that, we are also seeing the use of concepts and categories from whiteness studies to understand Hindu upper caste forms of affect, of behavior, uh, of privilege. And I think that is also a very interesting analytical and political development. So the image I've uh, got up here on the slide is uh, of Suraj Yengere and Cornel West embracing each other. I think it's a very moving and powerful image. And for me, it's evocative of these Dalit black solidarities that we are seeing uh, being forged in this moment and perhaps harking back to an earlier moment. I want to finally point to a different critique of Gandhi, one that I find extremely troubling. Uh, if you log on to Twitter on the anniversary of Gandhi's death, particularly Indian Twitter, you'll notice uh, hashtags trending that celebrate Gandhi's assassination and that celebrate his assassin, Nathuram Godse. And I've got some screenshots of, of that here. The arguments that the contemporary Hindu right makes against Gandhi are the same ones that were made at the time of his assassination, that he'd sold out the nation, the Indian nation, the Hindu nation, to Muslims, that he was in some way responsible for the creation of Pakistan, that he was too effete, that his techniques of protest and struggle were not masculine enough. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very gendered familial language in which, as the narrative goes, um, the father of the nation had sold out Mother India, and so her masculine, heroic sons needed to rescue her by, by uh, killing the father. So what do we do with all of this, and why might this be relevant to the kinds of issues that we want to think about today? I think tracking what happens to and around Gandhi's statues can help us to have a more complex and more complicated conversation about race. It's not always a black and white issue, either literally or metaphorically. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. It forces us to grapple with the politics of caste as a global category, not simply one that is relevant to South Asia. It prompts us, I think, to have uncomfortable conversations. Those one expects to be allies sometimes don't turn out to be so. And perhaps friends can be found in unexpected places. And it also makes us confront, I think, multiple critiques of the same object, here Gandhi, in the same time, which I think also forces us to reflect on the ways in which the enemy of one's enemy is not always one's friend. Um, I'll leave it at that, but I'm sure there's more to talk about. Thank you.
thank you for this. And I think it will, at least, yeah, I think, well, there's many questions, but let's start with um, what we discussed earlier as well. What is Gandhi's legacy today? So if this is where we are now, and you made sure to see all these complexities in it, what can it be today, Gandhi's legacy? I think it's kind of paradoxical because Gandhian techniques have been disseminated and appropriated so widely that even some of Gandhi's fiercest opponents, like Ambedkar, took up some of his techniques of nonviolent protest, of satyagraha, of um, fasting, of um, um, you know, uh, sit-ins, sit occupations. Uh, and the paradox is that everyone who believes in nonviolent protest is to some extent a Gandhian, even if they disagree with Gandhi's substantive ideas, which, of course, many people do. But I think on a substantive level, there are still Gandhians today. And the two issues, particularly in the Indian context, in which Gandhi, to me, is evoked most often, one is um, communal harmony or peace between different religious communities, particularly Hindu-Muslim um, so there are still uh, peace activists who will call themselves Gandhians and who um, uh, revive Gandhi as a, as, a, as a way of cultivating a different set of relations between Hindus and Muslims than the current Indian government would wish to encourage. And the other group, I think, are environmentalists who see in Gandhi's critique of uh, capitalism, it's a complicated kind of critique because he was very critical of modernity and capitalism, but often hung out with capitalists. So there's, there's more to be unpacked there. But his critique of the state uh, of development of uh, big institutions and a kind of top-down model of politics is one that is very much, I think, uh, still appreciated by environmentalists and some kinds of anarchists um, today. So it seems to me as if we have disaggregated Gandhi into these different pieces, and each of these pieces has a different afterlife, uh, which makes it quite difficult to have, for me at least, to have a singular view of, of him today. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. And uh, I would like to invite Britta as well, actually. And then um, you can ask questions. Are there any questions? Hey. Uh, yeah? Oh, m okay, many questions. I see a question here. Uh, hello, good morning. Um, if I may, I would like to um, t um, take ourselves geographically to another part of the world, because last night, I saw a very uh, interesting documentary on um, Abercrombie and Fitch, and it's the, um, they call it the rise and fall of a very American brand. And to make it very briefly, it, um, it, it's about the last 20 years, how it went from a brand that was focused on um, very white, uh, preppy type uh, uh, American, um, men and women, to uh, a brand that now bec has become very diverse. But these last 20 years reflected um, a change in the way society was seeing itself in the US and I think in most of the world. When they started to become aware that this focus on whiteness was not right and, they, and communities and citizens started to question this and eventually they took the brand to the court and things started to change. So now um, Abercrombie and Fitch has all colors, all shapes. So at the end of the, the documentary they ask one of the, 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 the interviewees, so are we a better society? And she says no. So my question here is, uh, in many parts of the world, we have been changing the last 20 years and we are becoming more uh, aware of the need to be inclusive and diverse and in the 
especially in the, in the case of this symposium, about the legacy of colonialism. So this new way of seeing heritage or this heritage is here to stay. Is this a fashion? Is the world becoming a better place because we are becoming more aware of the need of being inclusive? Thank you for that question. Who wants to answer? <laughs> do you uh, do you feel? Yeah. Uh, I I don't know if this this works. Yeah. Um, gosh, w wouldn't it be nice if I had just said yes? Huh? <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's what everyone's thinking now, possibly. Um, but I am thinking a um, little more critically of what is the driving force behind it. The company, like Abercrombie and Finch, they also want to sell products. Um, so I think there's a push and pull there of, of society holding uh, uh, companies and public institutions to account. Um, you know, the, the push, but also uh, other factors also involved. Um, so um, that isn't a direct answer to your question, perhaps, um, but uh, uh, a way of, of uh, getting at and complicating it perhaps a little bit further as well. To know what uh, mm. you think, Rahul. Um, there's, there's a, can you hear me? Yeah. There's a great book called Why I Hate Abercrombie and Fitch by um, a gay black US scholar who talks about the politics of desire that the brand um, encourages and the ways in which those forms of desire exclude all kinds of people from you know, the economy of desire that the brand cultivates. So I'm not sure that has changed so much. But also, um, just to come back to the, the terrain of your question, I think you know, we, we see a lot of corporate rebranding uh, in the era of <clears throat> so-called multiculturalism or racial diversity. But I think a lot of this is um, relatively less costly representation politics uh, rather than an actual redistribution of resources. Um, for example, during the Black Lives Matter protests, many companies uh, featured messages in solidarity with the protests. I think uh, Nike had advertisements with Colin Kaepernick taking the knee and so forth. But I think the question to ask is, uh, you know, what else has changed or not changed? Have Nike's labor practices changed? Have, you know, what is off stage? What are we not seeing in these corporate advertisements and diversity campaigns? And I think the story is usually one where the institution, whether it's a company or a university or a museum or any institution that is aware of its bottom line is trying to take the least costly way forward. And that usually means a, a politics of recognition, but not so much of redistribution. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. Uh, you talked about uh, objects which have a historical uh, value or for a value for families or personal values, but when um, does a, a meaningful object becomes an unintentional monument, or is it actually the same? Yeah, well, um, what I was proposing is that uh, it actually is already an unintentional monument because the colonial period officially, uh, uh, there are continuities, but officially has passed, belongs to the past and to the, the owners of these objects. It is firmly in the past and, and therefore, yes, it is a kind of unintentional monument. But that doesn't mean, of course, that its meaning can't change within that uh, across time to individuals, but also uh, as it's passed down through generation and generation. Of course, the stories, the anecdotes that go with this project, some of them are transferred, some aren't, and it's really interesting to see what actually survives along with the material itself that explain the material and give it more meaning. Uh, and, and like I mentioned, some, if it's you know a great-great-grandfather um, who brought um, 
uh, you know, an, an ethnographic item home uh, with him, and it's now in some attic, or it's uh, part of the, the furniture, literally. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes there, that connection is almost completely gone. Uh, and and it has it has very little meaning, um, and then is the the question then maybe of thinking of it as an unintentional monument, a way of grappling with it and bringing that back into focus. So I think that's the work that that kind of term can do. Thank you. But has a monument not always uh, also to do with publicity? So if it's only of a person or a family or something who uh, that is uh, kept away uh, somewhere, um, does that uh, fit the term monument then? Because we think uh, of monuments as a kind of, of um, telling a story to uh, un <laughs> limited uh, group of people, isn't it? Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a question really of, is, is something in private space, does it work the same way as something in public space, right? So, so can we use this, this uh, language that we use for public space, like monuments, and easily transfer that onto something that is uh, private? And um, yeah, it, it works a bit differently again, uh, I think, um, but... Uh, I think we can, <laughs> um, uh, but maybe other people think think differently. But um, is it so fundamentally different? Uh, is the way we um, interact with things um, fundamentally different as the way we do it in public space and the way we do it in private space? You may think of the way we interact in public space, it's often um, as part of a group, um, a, you know, group contestation, um, as part of an event. In private space, it might be an encounter that happens over a longer period of time. That might be with a smaller circle within the family. It might be as an individual. Um, that sort of reckoning happens uh, a bit differently. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, there are continuities. Um, there is the, the fundamental relationship of human with matter, and uh, how does that matter matter? Um, and, uh, and I think that's where a monument comes in because it um, heightens our awareness and, um, uh, yeah, again, refocuses the, the, uh, uh, what's going on in private lives and brings it on the same level of discussion as what's happening in, in public space. Um, but, you know, if other people uh, have something to add to that as well, I, uh, you know, welcome. <laughs> oh, I see two questions. Yeah, then maybe the woman up there who hasn't been, yeah. Thank you so much for very interesting introductions. Uh, anthropologist Ann Stoller um, formulated this concept of colonial aphasia. So the difficulty of speaking about something, of finding the right vocabulary, and it can be related to these monuments, both in Namibia, for example, the stories that are not being told in that architecture, and the Gandhi monument in Amsterdam. I was thinking of um, a similar initiative in Belgium, in Ghent, where they built this monument to, or this a statue of Nelson Mandela, but it seems to me that in both countries, these statues are honoring other empires, resistance fighters or activists, right? So are there silences also in the choices as to who is being represented uh, in these uh, monuments? Uh, yeah. Um, I, th I think there are always... Uh there are always inconsistencies and gaps, and, and sometimes it is easier to reach further away than to make a decision uh, that is much closer to home. Those, those uh, more distant icons are somehow less controversial because the community, the immediate community, is less implicated either for or against. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that might be what's going on in, in, the, um, in the case that you that you mentioned. 
But I'm also wondering, also in, in response to the conversation before, is there a difference between memorials and monuments? Um, and does that in some sense shape I don't know if that maps onto private public. I don't think so, because we also have public memorials. And um, I wonder if there is a difference between a monument, which is usually honoring somebody or something, and a memorial whose purpose is more one of remembrance without necessarily putting somebody up on a pedestal or, or according a place of honor. Um, and maybe that. It's a different axis than intentional, unintentional, but I think there is also that to consider in uh, in thinking about this issue. Yes, I think also we discussed earlier a little bit about how um, I was wondering if I had one of these questions, what I said before, um, what more precisely is the analytical yield of saying it's more complex? than just black and white, like this divide in it's rather good or bad, does it open the possibility to think histories of the past anew? But this, and then you also mentioned that perhaps these monuments, um, these statues can be sites for discussion, can be sites to talk about these, like memorial spaces maybe also can be, like come together and to sit with the past or nostalgia and think them true. Or, yeah. yeah, and can, can sort of reconfigured, uh, um, re-inscribed monuments uh, function as memorials these days? Is there a, a rationale behind actually keeping a destroyed statue in place and making it a memorial? Um, uh, there's, there are possibilities there, uh, perhaps. I think, you know, very often when we are arguing about a statue of a historical figure, what's really going on is we're arguing about ourselves and our relationships with each other. And the statue becomes um, a terrain onto which that more difficult contemporary argument is displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, it almost gives us a kind of a, a safer space, if you like, in which to renegotiate relations in the present. And I think it's really important to keep that present in view so that we're not just talking about you know, Gandhi at the late 19th century. We're also talking about relationships between uh, differently racialized communities today. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's only by grappling with that, I think, that we can understand the intensity of feeling that people have about this seemingly distant figure, but also have any hope of, if not necessarily resolving things, of, of being able to transform that antagonism into something else that we can actually live with, um, mm -hmm. e even if it's not you know, tied up and resolved. Thank you. Thank you both. And um, yeah, clap. <laughs> <laughs>
there will be drinks, as I mentioned before, at Fox Pop uh, for the closing uh, with spoken word by Ricardo Dom Domenic, poet and writer in residency at NIAS as well. And uh, one more very important thing, I want to thank Zara Kars, who did a lot of work for the whole uh, symposium to make it all go fluidly and help us all go where we need to go. Thank you all so much.